Okay, thank you very much um, for being here for this first talk on smartphones and privacy. We were discussing that just a little bit earlier. So is this going to be, it's a strange association like smartphone, privacy, right? Um, is this going to be the shortest talk ever? <laughs> um, so in this room, you probably know that they do not, uh, the, the applications there on your smartphone, well, they do not respect very well your privacy, right? Uh, so you're not here for that. Um, but what I am going to talk about is rather, well, how much is really leaking from those applications? Um, how can we spot privacy leaks, right? Because there's lots of technical people around here, so you probably want to know, okay, how can I see where things are leaking or not? And then, um, if possible, can we find some applications which are like the positive notes here, which uh, would relatively well respect our privacy or not? So what I did is that I collected like about 20 applications, well-known applications. So you've got Snapchat, Spotify, uh, Waze, Signal, uh, Temple Run, Instagram, plenty of those applications, like uh, famous ones that everybody would have on their smartphones, right? Um, I have no affiliation with those applications, nor no grief with them. I only selected them because they are really well-known applications. And then I did what I usually do with malware. I'm a malware analyst, right? I analyzed them. But here, of course, those are non-malicious applications. Uh, so for that, I used one of the tools I wrote, which is called Droid Lizis. It is open source. You can go and get it on GitHub if you're interested. And basically what that tool does is that it disassembles the Android applications, and then it looks into that for specific patterns. Uh, for instance, is um, it will uh, report, oh, this application is trying to run this or that executable. It is uh, obfuscated. Oh, um, it is uh, trying to retrieve, uh, for instance, your phone number, things like that. And then it lists like some bunch of detailed and technical report on that telling you, well, you've got this line that you might like or want to inspect more closely. You've got this or that, which also sounds a little bit suspicious and things like that. So I put all those applications in Droid Lizis and then inspected the results for privacy. So there, this is um, the only um, slide I'd like you not to tweet. Uh, it's not stats or take pictures of, it's just that I don't want this one to go in the world without any um, real explanation about it. And it's also that I hate the colors about the table. Right. Um, so on the left-hand side of the table, you've got the list of the applications I've been analyzing. So it's CGO. CGO is a geocaching application. Facebook, IGN Rando is a French hiking application. Instagram, K9 Mail, Marmiton is for cooking and recipes. Maps.me, Open Keychain, Oral-B is a smart toothbrush application. Sexscan QR for QR uh, scanning. Signal, Snapchat, Spotify, Strava, Temple Run, TripAdvisor, Twitter, Uber, Waze, WhatsApp, and Yuka. Yuka is another application which tells you basically if this or that food is healthy or not. And then the columns are various uh, things that I spot for those applications, um, like things that the ap application is trying to do. And then when you've got a green box, it means that the application is not requesting that. It's not uh, retrieving the information whatsoever. When you've got a gray box, it means that the application is retrieving the information, but that it feels um, really normal for that application. For instance, if you've got a geography application, well, obviously you're going to need GPS location, but that's pretty normal. It's not a privacy issue, it's what the application is meant for, right? And when you've got a red box, well, it doesn't mean necessarily that it's really bad, but at least it would probably require some more explanations from uh, the authors. So we're going to focus a little bit more on a few columns. One of the first things you can notice 
is that, well, there were uh, only two uh, applications in the bunch that I analyzed, which are not retrieving your GPS location. All the rest were retrieving your GPS location. I saw a tweet like two days ago about somebody who had noticed that, for instance, why is Signal requesting your GPS location all the time? That's yeah, a bit strange, right? Um, why is Marmiton? Marmiton is a cooking application. Why do, why do they need to know where I am at this precise time? Strange as well. Um, also, same thing, you have nearly all applications who are uh, retrieving your IMEI. So, as you may know, your IMEI, it's a unique number which is associated with your smartphone. It's not really sensitive. It's not like your birth date, your name, your first name, or your bank account, right? But it is still unique to your smartphone. So it's quite a handy way, unfortunately, to track people, people because they will be tracking your smartphone number, your smartphone, sorry, uh, that, that way. And this information, again, is being uh, retrieved by nearly all applications. And there's really a bunch of other unexpected queries. So I've highlighted some in yellow. But for instance, why does Instagram list all the installed applications that you've got on your smartphone? Why do you have many applications who are inspecting and sometimes messing up with your system logs? Why does Waze, for instance, check if you've got a debugger connected to uh, the application? Um, why do you have Yuka uh, retrieving your email address? Uh, so this is just to check if food is healthy. Why do you, they need my email address? And they're not asking for it like gently. They're just uh, going into... Um, uh, onto the, the account which is associated with the smartphone. From their, from that account, they're retrieving the, the email address in there, silently, kind of. Doesn't seem really uh, useful for them. Another issue is package size. You can actually develop fully-fledged applications with really well below 10 megabytes. There's no problem with that, and a few examples are, for instance, K9 email. Some of new you are probably using it. It's really, uh, it has lots of features in there. It can even support um, email encryption, decryption. It's working pretty well, and it only holds in five megabytes. Now, compared to that, you've got the enormous applications. Can somebody explain why Oral-B's smart toothbrush application is weighing 92 megabytes? Yeah, animations is part of it, and lots of third-party applications, but, I mean, they are kind of useless for the end user in the end. So it's kind of, I feel, for a, probably a waste of um, of megabytes there. Um, same for Waze, actually. Waze, okay, they do need to have lots of maps and things like that, but so do IGN or Rondo need to have maps. And they fit in six megabytes compared to that. Um, so, yeah, for developers in here, probably that's um, a practical point where you can have a look at and try to make your applications shrink, because if they are smaller, well, of course, the attack surface as well is going to shrink. Now we're going to have a look at a few applications directly. Um, so Instagram... I disassembled it, ha had a look, and the first thing is that I have never in my entire laugh, uh, life uh, seen such a big Android manifest. 535 lines for the Android manifest itself, with, of course, lots of permissions, and I tell you, uh, there's no way that you need so many permissions. Of course, the application is really collecting lots of information, but when I say lots, it's really lots. Okay, you've got the IMEI, we had kind of expected that one, IMSI, that's the subscriber number, and this is sensitive, no way this should be retrieved. Open file descriptors, all file descriptors that you have been opening, well, this is um, fetched and logged. Why? Uh, if your smartphone is uh, jailbroken or not, why do they care? SIM information, device information, screen metrics, network information, disk usage, etc. 
Okay, all of this. Now, I'm not saying that all of this is really sensitive, but the fact that you collect all of this, of course, uh, all together, it gives pretty lots of information of the end user. Some other features that I noticed, um, which are probably useful for Instagram at some point, but probably would require some explanations, is that they also seem to have hand tracking, body tracking, and face tracking. Okay, probably features that should be mentioned in privacy policies and should be possible to disable one way or another if possible. So when you have such an application and you want to trace and see uh, what HTTP requests the application is doing, well, of course, you can use, for instance, Wireshark and capture all the packets which are flowing from the application, right? Um, that works very well if you want to do that, so go on, no problem with it. The, uh, the, the only issue is, is that it's going to be difficult for you to make a difference between the requests made by uh, I don't know, Facebook, and the uh, requests which are made by Marmiton, for instance. So if you really want to pinpoint exactly, I want to see what requests are done by this application. What I have been using is Frida Hooks. So Frida is a dynamic instrumentation toolkit, and we build hooks around uh, all the API calls that create HTTP requests. And whenever such, a, such an API is called, well, you just write a hook where you just print out the URL and it will tell you, okay, this application is trying to go to this, this location there. So I have a video for that one. So uh, it's going to be a little bit small in the terminal, but we are there trying, uh, starting Frida. And as soon as you launch Instagram, well, you see that there are plenty of URLs which appear. Um, in that case, those uh, URLs are pretty legitimate. They are going to Instagram servers. Uh, but it's always helpful if you want to have a close look at it, because you'll see uh, everything, all the requests, and you see there really a bunch of requests for any action that you're doing on the application. And I had something interesting around here, I think. So we're going to jump straight to this point. At this point, I'm going to do a search. And I'm going to search for hack.loo. And now, you, it's probably a bit just too small for you, but I'm going to tell you. Here in this URL, you see h, then here ha, HAC, and then HACK. So you've got exactly what you're typing in each time you type a single letter. Well, it um, just creates an HTTP request, or HTTPS in that particular case, and it uh, does the request on that. So it means that Instagram at the other end knows everything you type, of course, we had a little bit expected that, but even if you're do you have a typo, well, they will know it. If you, by error, are uh, typing your password uh, instead of um, the um, what you are looking for, well, they'll know it as well. So this was um, to inspect HTTP requests, HTTPS requests also, um, and see if there are some privacy leaks in there. It's a pretty helpful technique. Um, there are some other uh, things to inspect if you want to spot privacy leaks, and there is, for instance, the use of Firebase. Firebase is a service which is... Um, uh, which is offered by Google and which uh, will um, basically help your application get crashlytics, analytics, and things like that. And here, this medical application is for diabetes. And for people who want to check regularly their blood glucose level, well, they have a um, connected sensor that they apply on their arm and then pass by the smartphone and scan uh, scan the sensor and it gives them automatically the blood glucose level, right? And the problem with that one is that the developers are, as you'll see, collecting lots of events there. So let me show you another video. So 
So here I am setting up the terminal to see all the events for Firebase. And on the other side, you've got the smartphone and you've got the connected sensor. Those are all the logs I had already uh, previously. Those are not the interesting ones. And then I'm going to open the application. And as soon as you open it, well, you notice lots of events are being logged and stored. And then every five minutes, they are sent remotely to a Firebase database. And here I just select a menu. Wow, that creates another event. I'm going to do it again, select another menu, other events there. And then if I decide, okay, I'm going to scan to get my blood glucose level, guess what? Yes, it creates another event. Right. So everything you do with that application creates an event which is sent uh, out to um, uh, to uh, well the developers database over there, and they can analyze that. So the good point, of course, there is that there is absolutely no sensitive medical information which is sent to uh, the remote database. Right? Nothing medically relevant. But of course, it is really intensive tracking. Whatever you do, whatever menu you uh, you press, whatever button you press on the application, whenever you scan to get your blood glucose level, all of this, all these events are stored and logged and sent to somebody. And there's no way to disable that. Um, Oral B, Oral B. So I already told you that application is extremely big. Um, there's another issue. Well, you've got so. Um, a connected toothbrush, and on that connected toothbrush, you've got um, a, a battery. And the smartphone application will tell you, of course, if the battery is running low. Right? It will tell you, oh, come on, uh, you're below 10%, you should go and get another battery. What is a little bit strange is that actually Google Analytics knows more than that, and actually has the full report. So Google will get all the notifications. Oh, end user is down to 60% of battery. 50% of battery. Oh, now it's 40% of battery. So at that, in, in that particular case, well, actually, um, Google Analytics knows more about your battery than yourself. I find that a bit strange, right? So I told you uh, I'm a malware analyst. So why is that an issue? It's a privacy issue, of course, but it's also an issue when it comes to uh, virus detections, right? Because how am I meant to make the difference between a genuine application that does horrible things and a malicious application that does exactly the same horrible things, right? So this is an issue, and of course it would be far helpful if we could design the nice applications to at least behave a little bit more or less, um, better. It's just like education. We tell our kids, uh, don't do this or that and behave better so that they cannot mix up, be mixed up with kind of criminals, right? So those are, uh, I'll pass by because time is running. Um, all the applications and the main privacy issues I found for those. This is the positive note. Those are three applications. If you want to develop an application and, um, those are really privacy aware. They are res more respectful than others, at least. So you can probably have a look at those if you are interested in them and installing them. Or if you're a, de a developer, perhaps uh, you can have a look at the code and see if there are good ideas you can pick up here and there. Um, so, of course, uh, I do know, I've been a developer for lots of years. I do not, uh, the developing, well, you've got many, lots of pressure about time and things like that. Uh, you've got to ship very quickly. But uh, I'd say that uh, when it comes to SDKs, it's a little bit like when you board a plane. You're only uh, allowed one luggage. If you come up at the boarding desk with 13 luggage, they're going to tell you, no way, you're, you can't board with all of that. Well, it's exactly the same thing with SDKs. Do not integrate like 20 or 30 SDKs in your application. It's going to be horrible to maintain. Uh, if you have security bugs in them in there, you won't be able ever, ever to fix them. So as much as possible, try to reduce the number of SDKs you are integrating. 
And then the final word, uh, it's not because data gives you valuable feedback that it's moral. Uh, I know it sounds a little bit naive, but it has to be said. Uh, I think it's important because nobody really talks that much about privacy. And um, if you are into the business of creating smartphone applications uh, and you have to write a privacy policy, I really recommend that you look at um, a really good article of the New York Times on privacy policies where they explain this or that privacy, how difficult that policy is to read, how difficult it is, how easy it is, and why and what kind of words should be used for end users to understand privacy policies. And I'm done. And I don't know if there's time for questions, but if there's not, anyway, I'll be around here during the entire week. <laughs>